Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Darsh Shah. And I'm Dr. Ultima Shraja. And welcome to Medicine Redefined. A podcast where we will explore the often overlooked but necessary components of health, what we consider to be the fundamentals. We will investigate topics and practices that can give you and your patients the best chance to optimize a healthy lifestyle. It's time to move the needle forward and put the health back in healthcare. Our guest today is Catherine Staffieri, a registered dietitian who currently works as the nutrition manager at NutriSense, which is one of the fastest growing health tech startups aimed to help you understand glucose management. It's one of the programs that allows you to transfer your glucose data over to software and then helps you with insight as far as what different types of lifestyle factors are affecting your blood sugar. Catherine has counseled over thousands of clients and she's reviewed over 750,000 hours of glucose data and recorded meals in the process while recommending nutritional adjustments to improve her client's metabolic health. She holds a master's in nutrition education from Columbia University and completed her undergrad work at University of Pennsylvania. In this episode, we go over what CGMs are. You may have heard of those three letters. It stands for Continuous Glucose Monitor. We talk about how they work, what they measure, and who should be using them. We'll then delve into the specifics of NutriSense, how the app works, how the program works, and how the coaching works. Last but not least, we touch on the effects of different lifestyle factors on glucose, such as sleep, exercise, stress, and nutrition. All right, time for the episode. Catherine Staffieri, thank you so much for joining Medicine Redefined. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Yep, absolutely. So I'm really excited. I know Altamash is as well to talk about CGMs, continuous glucose monitors, talking about diabetes and talking about, I guess, is somewhat of a newer trend. I mean, I know they've been around for some time, but more and more people are starting to use continuous glucose monitors. And, you know, we're really excited to delve into the data, see kind of what NutriSense has to offer, um, as well as how these monitors truly help um, from an optimization standpoint, but also from a lifespan, longevity, health span um, uh, standpoint. But first, why don't you take us through your journey? Because as we talked about offline, this is not really your first career. So take us through the weeds. Sure, absolutely. So um, I feel like, uh, you know, I've, I can't come to NutriSense. I've been there for uh, almost exactly two years. I started two years ago uh, last week. Um, it's been an incredible journey. Never did I think I would end up at a tech startup. Um, my undergrad work was in economics and math, uh, was not my intention to end up in health. <laughs> uh, but so happy that I did. I worked in finance and uh, the alternative asset management, you know, hedge fund industry decided that that was not really where I wanted to see myself long term and ended up going back to school to get my master's in nutrition education at Columbia and then wore many different dietary hats after that as many if you've ever been a dietitian they generally do like nine different things um, and so I worked um, outpatient at a hospital I had a private practice I did community outreach I've done a lot of different stuff um, and eventually I was like, I really would love to be able to reach a wider population. And that's where uh, NutriSense came in because what they do is they take this incredible uh, hardware, uh, they pair it with some really sweet technology and they give you a dietitian, a real person who's super smart on the other end uh, to help you achieve your fitness and, uh, and health goals. So I feel super lucky to be a part of NutriSense um, and it's been a great, great experience so far. So we briefly touched on, I think, the the difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist. I think we're familiar with this being in the healthcare field, but those who may be listening who aren't, can you help discern the two? Yeah. So a uh, registered dietitian, um, RD, uh, we actually have sort of co-opted taken back the nutritionist moniker. So that's why I'm an RDN, a registered dietitian nutritionist. But a registered dietitian is someone who is accredited by the academy. Um, and we have taken a national exam. Uh, we've gone through a one-year internship. We've gone, you know, we've done all the requirements. Um, and uh, we work in, a lot of times we work in accredited hospitals. Um, and we work very closely with physicians. Um, uh, certainly, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen them uh, throughout your uh, rotations. Um, I tend to think that we know a lot more than people give us credit for <laughs> in the clinics. <laughs> um, and I work with some really phenomenal uh, dietitians in the hospital. Nutritionists um, can be a little bit uh, more of a 
loosey goosey term. Um, and uh, anyone can kind of get a certificate sometimes um, and call themselves a nutritionist. Um, we like to really be evidence based um, at our job. We do have CNSs, certified nutrition specialists, and they also have gone through a rigorous training uh, and just sort of a, a separate but equal uh, pathway along with the dietitian. So, um, you know, we really, really try to make sure that everything that we're talking to our members about is evidence based, science based. Um, um, we like to make sure that everything we're talking to them about uh, has some real scientific backing. Yeah, I, I totally agree with the fact that us doctors will use RDNs to our advantage as much as we can, especially Ultimash and I being in a rehab setting where nutrition is so critical, right, to get our patients to become fully functional. And, you know, the amount of times I just want people to understand and realize how much really goes into a dietary plan, right? When somebody who can't even have full, you know, a full diet, talking about thin liquids, uh, regular diet, they might have a pureed diet. So really trying to even figure out based off their weight, we might have to get them up to 10 pounds to their baseline. How do we figure out the macros, the micronutrients, all that sort of stuff really goes into that. And so, I mean, I've definitely been using dietitians um, at, at, uh, whenever I can just to really learn as well, because there's a lot of things we don't learn in medical school from a nutrition uh, dietitian standpoint. So definitely just want to give you guys the plug there um, as well. I am curious though, how did you um, transition into NutriSense? Like, was there a reason why you didn't want to work at the hospital or did you think that, you know, NutriSense was really the best fit for you? I, I truly think that uh, wearable technology and I think using these kinds of tools, um, you know, it started out with just tracking, you know, calories on your, on the apps, on your phone, things like my fitness pal, lose it. All of these apps have been really helpful in, uh, people taking control and really learning what's going on with their own nutritional intake. Right. And so what's happening now is that they're taking it to the next level. Using something like a CGM can really help you dial into where you are currently and help you get to where you want to go. Uh, so that to me was so exciting. Exciting. I was like, oh, you know, it's nice to to meet with my regular clients and you know do a lecture here and there, or talk about you know uh, do, do a support group or some education. But we are reaching hundreds of thousands of people. We are helping people on an individualized basis, and we're using some incredible technology to do that for them. So it's like you know what a cool job for someone uh, like you know like, like the dietitians. And frankly, we work with. I think some of the most brilliant, I've got this army of colleagues that are so freaking smart all over the country. I'm so lucky to be able to work with them. Um, and we all just feed off of each other. Like, oh, I read this study or I saw this, or I worked with this doctor and they recommended this. And so um, it's, it's just been fascinating. Yeah. And I think there are very few people, if any left, who aren't wearing some type of wearable, right? I mean, I don't go anywhere without my Apple watch or, or really anything. And He's got his whoop on all the time and I have multiple other ones. Right. And, um, so let's, let's dive into CGMs. We, we brought it up a couple of times and I think still people don't really understand how they work or what they are. So as we've said before, continuous glucose monitors, so a little bit implicit what they might do, but talk a little bit about the technology aspect of it. How do they work? What is it? Do the people wear it on their wrist, like a watch, like, you know, somebody might've never seen it. But uh, if you could go into to that aspect of it. Totally. So the continuous glucose monitor is a sensor. It's about the size of a quarter. Um, it's pretty thin. And it has a tiny little filament in the middle of the circle. Uh, and what you do is you attach it. Uh, to the back of your arm. Um, and so it lives there. The life of the sensor is about two weeks. So it lives on the back of your arm. It sticks there. We put a little bandage over it to cover it. Uh, you can wear it in the shower. Um, you, know, you, can, you can do anything you want, sleep with it, everything. It just stays there for two weeks. And what that little sensor is sensing that's inserted in your skin is the amount of glucose in your interstitial fluid. Now, this technology is really interesting. It's been um, basically only worn by uh, diabetics in the past, right? Uh, and that's it's wonderful. You can you know, dose your insulin off of it, and you might have seen ads for it. We use the Abbott Freestyle Libre. Um, you know, they advertise on television, so it's not our hardware, right? Um, but what we've done is we've taken that hardware. NutriSense has taken that hardware, uh, and what you do is when you scan your sensor, it downloads all the data 
that has been collecting and it downloads it into our app so that then you can use that data to analyze uh, what's going on in your life. So we think it's super interesting for non-diabetics. You can uh, you know, be a type two or maybe pre-diabetic. Uh, we think it's interesting basically for anyone to use this kind of data to see how they're responding to their meals, how they're responding to sleep, to exercise, to stress, all of that stuff we can interpret through your uh, glucose data. So it's super exciting and really applicable to everyone. Why two weeks? Can the filament not stay in longer? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I don't know the the life of the device. I don't know um, how Abbott manufactured it. Some of them, I think, are are going a little bit longer. Gotcha. And then again, just to kind of recap, most of the, the medical providers or healthcare providers are familiar with the role of insulin, right? So anytime glucose goes up at some point, which variations are normal after any time you eat a meal or unless you have some pathology, it might be at other times fasting and stuff. Insulin comes along with the ride, right? And we have talked about, well, we've talked a lot about nutrition, but we've talked also about the carbohydrate insulin model. And I think that's one of the things that maybe is worth plugging in here that lately the interest has gone up because of this carbohydrate insulin model, which again, is not really new, but I think it's really taken mainstream, I'd say over the last three to four years, right? Would you say that's f fair? I feel like Jason Fung, one of his first books, um, The Obesity Code, I think that's what it was called. And maybe some of the other people were in there were talking about it. That's when really... Uh, a lot of the media started to grab attention and that's when they became popular. And I guess maybe the next question is you brought up diabetics, particularly type one diabetics who have uh, poor glucose control. What are um, some other patient populations, if even patient populations, healthy individuals or types of people that these work well for? Like essentially, who is it for? Well, we can, we think it's for everyone, um, 18 and older. <laughs> um, but uh, truly, I think, you know, it can be a, a recent diagnosis, right? It could be a, a pre-diabetes or a type 2 diabetes diagnosis, right? We do get a lot of people like that that say, I don't really want to be on metformin, or perhaps I've been on metformin and I'm sick of it. I'd like to get off. Um, a lot of times it can be women who have had gestational diabetes and know that they are at higher risk for developing diabetes later in life. Uh, they want to prevent um, that to happen. We get a lot of women that are going through perimenopause. They are having all sorts of hormone fluctuations. And as you guys know, the hormone systems, whether it's insulin, estrogen, progesterone, they are all uh, intricately related. And so we get a lot of women that are like, you know, help, I'm going through this crazy change in my life. I need some, uh, I need some advice. I need to know what's going on inside. Uh, we get a lot of endurance athletes. We get people that are super into their fitness. Um, perhaps they're re uh, returning from a recovery or they have upcoming races. They are really dialed into how their body is training, how they can operate optimize that. And clearly carbohydrates are necessary when you are training for any type of athletic event. Uh, so it's really fascinating for them to be able to dial into their fueling pre and post workout. So we get we get a real range of people. We also get uh, weight loss. Um, clearly, that's something that's on a lot of people's minds first and foremost, and, and is tied in with many chronic diseases. And so we do get people that are looking for uh, the use of the CGM to help them towards their weight loss goals. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I think the thing that comes to mind for me is all the populations you described have a goal. And I think every human living on this earth has some sort of goal when it comes to either health um, related activities or just trying to reach a certain weight. So everyone almost belongs into that special population. You did mention 18 or older, and I kind of wanted to delve into the normal variation of glucose before we kind of delve into CGMs, aberrant numbers, and what people may do for that. Can you just go through what maybe on a day to day, even decade to decade for life, um, and when, it, when we talk about aging, what glucose numbers should look like? That is that is such a great question. And when you look at the, you know, teenage, adolescent, teenage, I mean, their bodies are just these well functioning machines. <laughs> I mean, you can throw Coke and Doritos and, you know, who knows what at them. And it's like, woo, you know, they're, they're just so well run. <laughs> Everything's functioning so much faster. Uh, and they tend to have a, um, 
lower um, fat mass and higher lean body mass on average. Um, it's just that as we get into uh, older age, obviously, as you know, things start to break down, things start to sort of function not as fast, not as great. And we've put longer wear and tear on the system, right? So as we know with type 2 diabetes, it can be a real, uh, you know, it's sort of a, a marathon not a sprint to get there sometimes. And it can really be a, uh, decades of that really high, high, high churn of insulin and eventually you know, the burnout um, and the insulin resistance and then you know, the lack of sensitivity, if you will, to insulin in the cells. And that, that takes a long time to get there. So that's really why we see more of the uh, older populations, older decades having much larger incidences of insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes in, in that way. Got it. And I would say in general, we don't really differentiate in terms of our uh, member population in terms of optimal glucose control. We try to meet everyone where they are, depending on uh, your health and your medical background, you know, your own personal health history. But generally, we like to see people's glucose to be anywhere between uh, 70 to 140. If you uh, are type 2 diabetic or are, you know, are along that, that health route, um, we, we, we will extend that up higher to like a, a 180 uh, cap um, or 200, just depending on where the person is. But that's what's so great about what we're doing is that not really conventional medicine. We're not trying to fit anyone into one certain box and saying you must, you know, we're looking at you at one moment in time. You know, we all get our annual fasting glucose at the doctor and that's you know, that's Tuesday. Well, what did you do Monday night? You know, is that a really good uh, capture of who you are and what your health is? So that's the other big plug for the continuous glucose monitor. As physicians, you guys know, you get a blood panel. Some of it is retrospective, like an A1C or something like that. Maybe that gives you a glimpse of the past three months. Your fasting glucose is one point in time. I mean, Maybe they weren't really fasting. Maybe they had gone out on a bender the night before. We don't we don't really know. Maybe they went keto for like three days to look really good. So, you know, you can't really tell what someone's doing. They can kind of game the system, right? So what you can see with the gluco, the continuous glucose monitors, how someone's doing 24-7, day after day. Our patients, our clients love sharing this information with their doctors and their doctors are saying, oh my gosh, this is so helpful. I can see the deviations. I can see what you're doing on the weekends versus the weekdays. It's it's incredibly, it, it, it's an incredible, incredibly powerful tool um, and data load that you can really extrapolate trends from. That's interesting. Uh, well, I think a, a point worth highlighting is the higher numbers you were mentioning, 140, 180, that's the post prandial. Right. I think if somebody's in the fasting range at that point, then we're certainly concerned. Um, yeah, the the point about physicians using this data and seeing the trends over a period of, I guess, two weeks, I can see why that would be important and actionable. Right. And for, for that's exactly one of the reasons I think that you guys are providing them coaching so they actually can digest the data and, and make it actionable. But I'm also wondering is you guys have been around for a couple of years are physicians routinely using this in their practice and then changing management time and time again because the challenge that i see is well as we've talked about you know medicine is somewhat of a business and you need to be able to, to put different codes in you need to assign the values and then you need to be able to bill for them so the insurance companies are trying to reimburse considering this is an out-of-pocket expense for healthy individuals how are they integrating that and using that to make decisions does that question make sense yeah, and I wish I could say everyone's doing it. <laughs> um, everyone should be doing it. Uh, you know, all I can say is from feedback from our members, uh, obviously, when they are a physician, or we get a, a lot of nurses, uh, a lot for them um, is learning just their own, you know, again. You can study all you want. You can you know, you can read it in the book. You can take the test. You can look at someone's chart. But when it's your own body and you're testing it on yourself and seeing how you, know, it's really fascinating. Um, and when you're working with your own data and seeing that, I think it it 
turns a lot of lights on for people. Uh, we do see it a lot with uh, physicians that are working and nurses that are working night shifts. Uh, their glucose values are very different than people who work um, on the regular sort of circadian rhythms. So in terms of professionals using this for themselves, it's eye-opening. In terms of them integrating it into their practices, I think it's a huge opportunity for, um, I think, really any physician. If you're an endocrinologist, if you're a family physician, uh, 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 you know, OBGYN, all of this kind of stuff is so key to helping your uh, patients have their optimal outcomes, be it prevention, you know, they're edging into those higher ranges of whatever their blood workers saying, um, or they're already there and you're trying to get them off some medications or you're, you know, they're tr really trying to improve their health outcomes. Yeah. I suppose the next question to ask is, aside from pediatric populations under 18 and pregnant women, who I don't think it's approved for, right? Who is this not for? What's the person who you would say, mm, CGM's not for you? Mm -hmm. I, I will say um, it, it can be triggering for those who have a history of um, disordered eating. So this um, can be uh, a difficult thing to face and it can, uh, bring back perhaps old habits um, or unhealthy habits. Uh, that could be binge eating, that could be um, you know any of the spectrum of eating disorders. So we do find that uh, if you are struggling in that area in your life, this probably isn't the right time for you to use something like this. Let's maybe go a little further down that rabbit hole, right? I think, I don't wanna make this to disordered eating pathologic binge eating disorder, anorexia, all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, I, I, I do understand just from my brief reading of that, I, there, there are a lot of eating disorders are underdiagnosed or just misdiagnosed, right? In the general population. And I suppose the challenge is, you know, I think about a company that I've referenced time and time again, because I think they do great work, right? Precision Nutrition. And they have like these annual surveys with their patient, um, with their clients that they, they publish out. And time and time again, the number one thing that these surveys show from people who struggle with weight loss or their health goals, body composition, et cetera, is because they have emotional eating or stress eating, right? I mean, we, we all struggle with that. Right? You're, maybe my med school roommate who was a, like probably a robot or as close to one who didn't like chocolate or desserts. But aside from that person, most of us, when we're stressful, have a poor night's sleep or work a night shift, we want something sugary, salty, like that's, that's these hyper palatable foods. So I suppose um, a long way of asking is how do you tease out like actual binge disordered stuff versus somebody's just having this natural emotional response and just stress eating, quote unquote. So, you know, that's, it's, it's a great, it's, it's definitely something that we are hyper aware of. Um, and we do ask uh, when you are signing up to a test that you are not currently, uh, you know, going through one of these, um, one of these eating disorders. So that's one step, although it's easy to skirt that and, and, you know, perhaps not be totally honest. Uh, but we, there, there are red flags along the way that we've all seen We're we're all pretty seasoned dietitians in terms of counseling with people. Um, you know, we can see when someone's Oh, mad, and they just really aren't eating. Um, you can pick up on things that they say. You know, I oh, that's too fattening for me, or I've never eaten that. That makes me feel so terrible afterwards. Mm. Um, we also are really again this this tool for us, and and our approach is everything is allowed, right? We're not we're not trying to proselytize and commit anyone to a specific diet plan. We're here to help you Darsh and you Altamash to find out what works best for you because it's not the same for anyone, right? So we're not trying to spit, you know, put anyone into a certain box. So when we do find that people are really um, avoiding, they, they avoid change, they avoid having sort of an open mind, testing things out. These are all kind of red flags to us that maybe this person's struggling uh, on a deeper level. But, you know, we do also see a lot of people that say, you know, we, we can see in their glucose data, right? You know, Friday night, Saturday night, you know, huge swings, lots of stuff happening. Um, you know, what happened? And they were like, oh, it was a huge night out. I went overboard or it's Sunday night. And, um, watching the game and I was at a sports bar and I just went totally crazy. I mean, most people are honest and, and they will tell you, you know, that was a one-off or that's my weekly indulgence. Um, and so you can, you can kind of test 
you, you can get a good idea of where people are approaching their food. Uh, but it is, it's rampant. And I think the term orthorexia is certainly getting more headlines lately. People being very aware of healthy eating and how that can mm. lead into other unhealthy eating patterns. Right. Yeah. No, I love the, the concept that you're talking about. There's nothing restrictive about this at all. I think that a lot of people will say that, especially the first couple of weeks, maybe even months of you using the device, the amount of insight that you get is probably the most powerful thing. Would you say that's the case? And then, you know, afterwards, depending on, I guess, what your baseline understanding of nutrition and macros and all that kind of stuff and how your body responds to that, then, you know, it becomes an extremely powerful behavioral tool. And I think that that's the part that, that excites me the most is because despite being on this health train and stuff like I got a toddler at home and he's got these little peanut butter things called bombas. I don't know if you guys have heard of them. They're lethal. And <laughs> I told my wife, I was like, we can't have them because she never gets to eat them. Cause I just finish them all. I guess. So anyways, beside the point, but uh, and, you know, and especially when you have these challenging days. Uh, and so I think that just having that little thing there and then seeing what type of response you might get, um, if nothing else, it's an accountability tool. Uh, and I think that's the part that I love the most, you know, I suppose somebody who I respect a lot and I've been listening to this person's podcast for a long time, AC Sinkowski, she's, she's a, a really good nutritionist and she had a, a podcast way back when on CGMs and talking about it. And she uses interesting analogy. Um, didn't think that they had a lot of merit for a lot of the people because the analogy she used was kind of like, let's just say you're the CEO of a company. Right. And if you're trying to operate the business and you're getting day in and day out inundated by with every single expense and rather than a prof profit and loss statement at the end of the month, you're getting, OK, uh, you know, the, the toilet seats cost this much. And then this was an expense. And you're just kind of getting throughout the day, every single expense um, that's it's going to make very challenging for you to do your job. And the way that I relate it is like if you're getting all these glucose spikes up and down after you have a couple of raisins or you know, if you have an apple in the morning and stuff like that, at the end of the day, if you're not accounting for quantity, right, and you're only looking at your spikes and you're trying to normalize your spikes for the day, but maybe you're still eating more and you're you're not maybe measuring your weight and stuff like that, does it even matter, right? If weight loss is your goal or if long-term metabolic health is your goal. Now, I suspect I know where we're going to go with that. But before you do that, I also love this fact, that, and maybe you could address this, is that you also brought up that you guys have dietitians who are coaching at least for the first month for people, right? Mm -hmm. Is this correct? Yep. And at, from previous, some research that I've done, people have access to them 24 seven during the week at least. Is that unique to you guys or other companies who offer the similar service also provide that coaching um, at least for a brief period of time? To the best of my knowledge, we are the only ones out there to offer a complimentary month of dietitian support uh, when you sign up with NutriSense. And I truly think that that is what helps us be the best, right? You can download the, 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 the Librite app and just check on your own. Uh, you can take a thousand finger sticks a day if you want to um, and record your own, uh, your, your own blood glucose data. But to have a professional there that can offer you actionable items, ways to improve, help you reach your goals and offer you things that you might not even know about, research on caffeine, research on alcohol, research on all kinds of things. Um, and uh, we've been there, we've done it, we've seen it ourselves that kind of buddy, that kind of partner, that kind of um, sometimes, you know, tough love to get you back on track when you've gone off a little bit can really be helpful. Uh, we, we think it's a really incredible tool. And I do think to your point about the spikes, and I think I'm I think I'm answering the right question, but please correct me if I'm wrong. We get a lot of people that wear this and they say, well, my glucose looks great. So what? How, how is this going to help me? You know, um, and you know, I didn't go over 140 ever. I look pretty good. My standard deviation is exactly where it's supposed to be. We can, there's, there's always ways to optimize. There's always something that you can work on. Perhaps it's body composition. Maybe sure your glucose looks great, but you have very little lean mass, right? So let's work on that. Let's figure out ways to fuel your body so that you can increase your protein and increase that that great storage space because that's where the muscle, uh, you know, the body loves to store glucose in the muscle. 
we know, obviously you guys know how important muscle is on the body and how we lose it as we get older. So even if, you know, on, uh, in your stats, it looks, you know, pretty good. There's always something to work on. And we find the CGM, I compare it to like a window inside of your body, right? So you can see, you know, what's, what's happening. Maybe you have GI issues. You can see some of that inflammation. Maybe you have cortisol, you're spiking your cortisol all the time. We can see all of that. And it's fascinating how you can make small, little changes with the help of your dietitian to really improve some of that inflammation in your body, lower your risk for heart disease, help improve your GI system if you've always been struggling with that. There's so many ways to apply this data. Love that. Yeah. I mean, we talk about all the time, muscle is just a metabolic sink, right? So more where you can put it on that as you're talking about one of the reasons adolescents and, you know, even a lot of people in their twenties can get away with things up to 30 depending on what your training background is, you do have a lot of muscle, but also your hormones, right? The turnover, the metabolism, all those kinds of things. Um, although some recent data suggests that metabolism doesn't necessarily tend to slow down more activity and that kind of stuff. But, um, uh, you brought up this, uh, caffeine and I want to take this side road for a minute, uh, because what I do know, we talk about when people are talking about fat loss supplements and just from a fat loss standpoint, a, a supplement caffeine is very potent right? Increases your thermic effect and increase your metabolism in that regard. It's also contributes a bit to insulin resistance from what I understand. And I always have a challenge reconciling those two things, whether from a metabolic health, if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Can you help me figure that out if you are familiar with that type of data? Well, you're, you, you bring up the, the idea of the thermic effect of food um, and that recent ish study that was, I think last summer about, uh, kind of proving that metabolism is what it is for many, many, many decades. Mm -hmm. And there really isn't a, a whole lot we can do to, uh, to alter it, even if we get pregnant or, you know, anything like that. Um, yes, agreed that, uh, there have been studies that have shown that caffeine can increase, um, the, 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 the thermic effect. But when you're looking at the total um, you know, impact of your of your calorie expenditure, you know, your basal metabolic rate, it's a very small portion of it. Um, so even if you were to increase your caffeine intake by you know, huge amount to really increase that, it's not going to drastically alter your basal metabolic rate. I would also say that particularly, again, uh, specifically uh, to, to, to glucose, we see a ton of caffeine spiking your glucose because it's spiking your cortisol levels. So the trade-off of, yeah, like, you know, maybe there's a small increase in terms of how much you're burning, but you're like wired and, 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 and uncomfortable. And then you're going to crash later on as well. And I also think that a lot of people are, you know, some, some people are sensitive to it and some people aren't. So some people might be taking in a lot of caffeine, but they're not actually, uh, as sensitive to it as, as others. So when we see the caffeine coming into the system, sometimes we see a pretty big spike and then a crash. And then these people are exhausted. They need more caffeine. They have the mid morning snack, you know, it's sort of, it begets this cycle of, of snacking and eating and snacking and eating for them that is not helpful at all and offsets any of that potential uh, minor increase that you could see from it. Okay. That's interesting. Two part question. Are there some sources of caffeine, maybe green tea, black tea, other source of tea that are gentler when it comes to that cortisol spike, uh, just from the data that you've seen. And then also, when people who are high caffeine, let's just say coffee consumers, right? They over time will get desensitized and that adenosine receptor over time, when it's desensitized, it's primarily, I think in the brain that that's happening, right? But do you know if it's uniformly getting desensitized or is it desensitized only in the brain? So you have to consume more to get that neurocognitive effect, but metabolically, you're still getting the jacked up cortisol, which is affecting your, your glucose. That's a super interesting question. I don't know the answer to over time in terms of over time, five years, 10 years, you know, wh what changes in terms of the receptors. Mm. Uh, I will say particularly with women, things crossing over the blood brain barrier, uh, particularly during the perimenopause and menopause stage, they can try to increase their caffeine intake because of the brain fog. And really it's actually more of a estrogen uh, and, and the estrogen receptors. So I think a lot of times people are using caffeine 
to help in a way that is not actually the, the, the right path of, you know, pathophysiological way to help what's, what they're feeling, um, physiologically. Does that make sense? Um, I think, I think caffeine's a tricky one. I know there's a lot of mixed stuff on yerba mate, which has some, um, uh, you know, which, which is a caffeine based plant, uh, supplement, but I don't have the, uh, I don't have the science behind dosages, uh, and what the, uh, what, what the literature says on it right now. For sure. And I think it'd be interesting, right. As far as having a CGM and seeing that if you're trying to your, I mean, I have green tea, white tea, the oolong, I do black coffee, I do the yerba. So that'd be pretty cool to kind of see what I'm interested in understanding is from your perspective as the dietitian with NutriSense and let's say I'm the patient. I go ahead, I buy the CGM, putting it to the back of my triceps. Can you tell me the interaction from your perspective of what you're looking at from day zero of when, you know, I get this, I now am inputting my meals, uh, my blood sugar is being tracked. Tell me what you're looking at from day zero all the way up to, you know, day X. Absolutely. That's great. So we get notified that we have a new uh, member, a new person that, you know, me as a dietitian that I get to follow. I get notified that Darsh has activated his sensor. So I'm super excited. Um, and what I get is a long, I shouldn't say it's that long, but I get a questionnaire that you've filled out that gives me your goals. And that really sets the stage for how I am going to approach you. And I'm going to know that, oh, Darsh's goal for this is to uh, promote longevity. Or his goal is that he's running um, a 10K and he wants to make sure that he's fueling properly for it. Or, oh gosh, Darsh unfortunately got um, you know a diagnosis recently and he's hoping not to take any medication for it. So that's really the initial jumping off point. And I just want to emphasize how individual it is, right? I'm not jumping in there with my set programming for you because I don't know what you want to get out of this, right? I don't know what your job is. Maybe you work night shifts. I have no idea, right? So it's that initial uh, goals questionnaire and health questionnaire that I get to know who you are and what you want to get out of this program. So then we start by doing just a, the basic analysis of what's going on with your glucose. And we love to get that baseline value. We tell our initial members, just do your normal thing. Like you do you for a couple of days, because let's see you know, where you are before we start to make tweaks or changes. And we can identify maybe where those problem areas are. So we're going to basically look and just see how are you in range, right? We have a basic range of 70 to 140 milligrams per deciliter. And it's just shown in a green band on your screen. And you can just see very easily how, how often are you staying in that range, right? Are you frequently going up and down? We're looking at just those basic trends, right? And the, the app gives you a, a thousand metrics. We slice and dice your data seven ways to Sunday. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, but the dietitian will reach out with those kinds of just basic understanding of your goals. And then let's start to just see a general idea of what's going on with your trends to get, to get started. Catherine, have, do you guys collect data from patients, either prior A1Cs or maybe people, if they do get, um, their glucose, like daily, glucose, so just fasting glucose over the last, you know, people sometimes will check the, the finger stick on a daily basis. Do you guys get that type of data ahead of time? Because I think about the Hawthorne effect, right? Even though you ask people, hey, don't make any changes, just the fact that they know they're oh, yeah. quote unquote being monitored, um, they're going to make changes, right? This is well documented. So is that something that you also look at? Absolutely. So again, within that questionnaire, you are able to input any uh, recent labs. You can send us your labs. Um, a lot of people will send us lab uh, lab work to be reviewed. Um, we take a little bit longer to go through that, and uh, we're not <laughs> we're not going to make any you know, large judgment calls on that. But um, but we can certainly take a look at lab, uh, recent lab work that you've had done. Um, and there is room in the app to um, add in if you're measuring glucose on your own with a finger stick on a daily basis. You can also add in ketone measurements if you're taking ketone measurements on your own. Um, there's lots of different extra things you can add on to it. And absolutely people are like, no, 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 this is totally how I eat when all of a sudden they're moving more They're, you know, and they also tend to not log things and you see like, but you can see it in their data. You can be like, well, what, what happened last night? Mm. <laughs> you know, I saw a huge spike and people are generally like, oh, well, you know, I ended up having more dessert or it's just sort of like, oh, I didn't realize how much I had yeah. been snacking last night, you know, th then they really realize. So it nothing can be happened. The, the sensor is faulty. It's faulty. Right, right. I must have bumped it. <laughs> um, oh, actually, that brings a question. Is, is there, 
I do think this is the one, right? Like you, you have to, in terms of some people said that the data is, you see aberrant data if they're sleeping on their arm or something like that. Is that affected as well? Correct. Yeah, it's a you know pressure. When there's pressure on the sensor, it can cause a false dip. We really only tend to see it, um, you know, at night if you're if you're wearing it and you're a side sleeper or something like that. You can see kind of a false dip sometimes, but usually bumps right back up as soon as you roll over. Okay. Um, okay, so it's only a dip. It won't go the other way. Like it won't be a spike. No, that's that's determined by other factors, exogenous factors, things like, you know, what you ate the night before, how late you ate, um, stress, hydration, all right. of that. So I certainly want to come back to that in terms of, you know, tactics and strategies that you've learned in your time kind of looking at this stuff. But I want to talk a little bit more about the sensor. I understand that some people, I think the, the you said the Freestyle Libre is the one that you guys are using. And I think a couple other companies will use that as well. But the other very popular one in terms of from patients that I see, the insurance companies is the Dexcom, right? Mm-hmm. I think G6 is probably the most up-to-date one. And from a like a medical grade standpoint, I think, although I did have a patient yesterday who had the Libre as well, but um, more more the you know the medical grade ones or the, the ones the endocrinologist would prescribe are going to be the Dexcom. And I think one of the reasons people say in terms of a calibration issue with the Libre thing is that like, what can you say to that? And, and, and maybe even elaborate on it specifically what that is, because I don't think I did a good job telling people what the issues might be. Yeah. So actually when it comes to calibration, you know, those, those apps like the Libre app is calibrated slightly different than ours because people are dosing insulin off of it. Right. So they have to really be, they, they have a lot more sensitivity around lows, um, because someone could be dosing insulin off of it. So we, you can calibrate, um, on our app, your sensor. Uh, and we do that to a fasted glucose, either from a finger stick that you're taking at an at-home, you know, glucometer score or a recent lab draw, something within the last three months. So you can calibrate the sensor, um, within our own app. And it, it is slightly different than what you would see on a Libre from the, from the Libre app because of the dosing of insulin and just the sensitivity around it. But was there a specific reason you guys chose to use the Libre instead of the Dexcom? Oh, good question. Uh, perhaps before my time. I'm not sure. And I don't, I don't know about the integration right now with our app and Dexcom. Um, it could be something they're exploring on the product side. Got it. I want to come back to a term you used earlier. You talked about orthorexia. I think that's an all time. I think really anything with respect to health and wellness and I don't know, Darsh, maybe we're guilty of contributing to that. Um, it, it's kind of an all-time high, right? Sleep, right? Um, the, the good that that Matthew Walker has done by putting his book out, by people becoming more aware of their sleep, in my opinion, certainly outweighs the bad. But there is certainly some bad to talk about, right? We've talked about this with Dr. Jade Boo a couple of times before, where people are hyper-focused into their insomnia and their sleep, and that's only contributing to further pathology. So this term orthorexia that you're talking about, people being hyper aware of their eating patterns and just just healthy eating in general. What concerns do you have with this just kind of movement going towards more CGM, more towards nutrition, and then, you know, CGMs contributing to that? Like I know we talked about for somebody who has true pathology and disorders that it's not the right thing for them, but just coming back to the general population, where the basics are what's going to drive ninety percent of the change for them. Right. Like, how do you have that conversation where you're like, you know what, you're not there yet because you are offering that dietitian support. You're seeing that. Right. So you're having a conversation with these people. You said, look, you know what, you need to focus on maybe just like the ABCs before this data, because this is only confusing you and, and actually backfiring. Yeah, I think, you know, again, we are highly trained dietitians in terms of uh, you know, clinical thing. You know, we, we've all gone through a dietetic internship. Many of us have worked in highly specialized clinical situations, either diabetes or just you know within hospitals and stuff. But there's also a huge element of counseling um, and that um, you know MI those MI skills and really hearing someone and learning what their ultimate motivation is we can pretty easily identify someone who's having you know, kind of struggling. And a lot of times we do see women and, and some men that are under eating. And so that's that's one of those sort of triggers of the, you know, they think that they're uh, doing all the right things and they're exercising a lot and they're just not taking in enough 
uh, to help them meet their goals, whatever it is. And we really help counsel people to take small steps you know, perhaps to broaden their uh, macronutrient profile, maybe they're fat phobic, you know, they, they, they've been so worried to have any fats and we help them explore that and we give them, you know, they get to see in real time data that it's not hurting their body, right? That, that maybe their performance, um, you know, at their HIIT class is even better when they are fueling before they work out. And so we really try and broaden people's, um, uh, nutritional profile if we feel like perhaps they've been too restrictive in the path, past. Um, and we try and help them down a path of more food acceptance and, and, and you know, really seeing that it's helping their body, not harming their body. So in that sense, this is a great tool to show someone, hey, look at all this progress that you're making. Look at how great your body's doing with the different types of foods that you're eating. How do you extract that information out of them, right? I feel like a lot of people might be reluctant to kind of go with that information and feel like I'm, I'm, I'm being very reluctant. Are you interacting with them and then trying to extract that just through coaching um, tactics or do they fill out a questionnaire um, as well um, as the weeks go on? Yeah. I mean, one of our questions in the beginning is what's your style? What kind of coaching style do you want? You know, are you tough love? Are you an mm-hmm. educator? Do you want a friend? Uh, so we, you know, mm-hmm. we, we take that into consideration. I love it when okay. I get the tough loves. Cause I'm like, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going after you. <laughs> I'll hold you to it. Um, but uh, yeah, so so there's that. And if someone's not logging or um, you know missing a lot of scans, they're just not really into it. You know, we have some ways of trying to engage them again. But sometimes you just have to understand that they're just not ready to make a change. They're just not on that. You know, they're not in a state of change yet in their minds. And maybe they're just going to use this as a tool to help them make that change down the road. And all you can do is offer them some information, some insights, some encouragement. Um, you know point out, hey, looks like your breakfast yesterday was really well tolerated. You know, whatever you had, you know, it looks terrific. You know, m- try that again later tomorrow. And and it's mm-hmm. really kind of a, we try and be motivators uh, for healthy behavior changes. I love that. I think so often we quickly go into coaching mode without asking how they want to be coached, right? And I mean, that's the, that could be 80 to 90% of their way of getting to success is just by asking them, what's your coach? Like, what's your learning style? So I absolutely love that. Um, while staying on this topic, you did mention how do, from the questionnaire, people will have different goals, whether it's a 10K, whether it's longevity. How are you coaching through those goals? Like, what are you looking at specifically when it comes to glucose monitoring um, in order for individuals to reach their goals? Yeah. So, you know, if it's longevity, a lot of times that's just minimizing your glucose spikes because we know that chronic high glucose uh, fluctuations can lead to inflammation. And obviously we all know that the inflammation cascade can be detrimental in the long run. So it's kind of explaining how their day-to-day choices might be influencing their ultimate goal of promoting longevity. Um, Again, we never want a flat line of glucose. That's not really sustainable. Um, nor manageable in the long run, but it's helping them to understand what's going on in their bodies so so that they can attain those goals. And again, many times it's not even food related. I know we touched on this before, but you know, your goal might be longevity, but you lead an incredibly stressful life and you're not sleeping or, you know, taking care of your well being, and it's showing up in your body. Um, so it's, I think that's can also be very eye opening for people. They, and they also think that they have, they might have one goal, but using this data, they ultimately see down the road that maybe it's something else um, uh, that they truly want to work on. Following up on the piece of change and being ready for change, you you mentioned that whenever somebody signs up, the minimum amount is one month. Is that correct? Correct. In your experience, what's the average time? I, I understand there's individual variability, but just kind of looking, you know, big picture here, do you, do you feel like one month is enough? for change, you know, for people to say, okay, look, I have the information that I need and I think I'm, I'm ready or like to be able to, to buy, establish that rapport, the therapeutic alliance to, to steal a phrase from Dan Pope is is one month enough time. Or do you feel like that's, you know, the success rate is lower in that end? I could give you my marketing answer, which is absolutely not a 12 month, 12 month is the, (laughs) is the ultimate is the best one you could uh, purchase. Uh, No, I'm, 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 I'm joking. I think 
I, I hate to go back to the individual, but you know, it could be someone, you know, we've all heard of those people that, do, that they, they do a five day reset, right. Or they're training for one race and they, they institute this amazing workout policy for three weeks. And then, you know, after the race, they, they don't go back to it. So personally, I think one month allows you to see within, you know, think about a month of your life. What do you go through? You probably go through a couple cycles of work, maybe some downtime, maybe some busy times. You go through some social events with your family. Um, you have an opportunity to see all different aspects of your life. You have the opportunity to play it really straight and narrow. You have the opportunity to fall off the wagon a little bit. Um, I think one month shows you a lot of data. I don't think one month allows you to see true behavior change and true long-term adjustment to your uh, blood glucose statistics, right? Um, I think you need to see that more on like a three-month basis um, to be able to see a really true reduction in like a fasting glucose or something like that. I think it, it, it just takes longer. In order to really build muscle um, to maintain a lower baseline glucose, yeah, you could put on some muscle in a month, but I think if you instituted a decent strength training program, it probably takes about three months to really build up a lasting um, store of muscle. So I think in general, three months, you're going to see the changes, but within a month, at least you can see where your baseline is and and get a really good read of where you are. So Catherine, you also mentioned, um, you know, rightfully a lot of people listening are going to correlate and think about sugars and glucose monitoring with food, right? Think about insulin spikes, insulin resistance, all that. But you made it important point that being highly stressed can, you know, definitely influence that as well as your sleep. I mean, there's a bunch of lifestyle factors. Do you mind going through some of those lifestyle factors? Let's touch on sleep or exercise and the impact that they have on glucose and the tips and tricks that you would use with your, uh, with the clients, um, in order to get that glucose more stable. Absolutely. Yeah. I just, I was invited to do a presentation for Rivian a couple of weeks ago, and this was exactly what we talked about, which was, you know, kind of that, that basic, what we call the four pillars of health. Um, we, you've got nutrition, but you've also got uh, exercise, sleep, and stress, which are really, really incredibly important when it comes to not only your glucose management, but just obviously, you know, longevity, health um, over time. So what we like to talk about a lot with movement um, is, again, what do you feel comfortable with? What are you doing currently? We've got endurance athletes, we've got marathoners, we've got CrossFitters, we've got people that haven't moved since 2016. So there's a, a like, we, you know, we get a whole spectrum. And listen, it, a lot of it depends on your lifestyle. We all leave incredibly busy lifestyle. So when it comes to movement, we give them, there's a recent study published not that long ago, March, February, um, glucose improvement better with 10, uh, 10, three times, 10 minutes a day versus a 30 minute chunk, right? Nice to have mm -hmm. the science behind it. We all kind of knew that anyways, uh, but we love to send that out, right? Who doesn't have 10 minutes? You're probably scrolling ESPN or Facebook or something for 10 minutes anyways. Like get up, do something, walk around, um, do some squats, do something. So we love to use that as a motivator for people that aren't super active in terms of using up your glucose. And I think a lot of times people don't even understand how exercise and glucose work, like they don't quite get it. And it, I mean, it's simply like you burning up the fuel that you might have taken in and or the glucose that has previously been stored in your muscles gets used. It gets taken out of your muscle. We sort of call muscles like, you know, our cubby holes takes out, you know, taken mm -hmm. out, used up. And then you have now storage space that the next time you eat, your glucose can go into your muscles and it's not floating around in your bloodstream, right? So we, sometimes you have to just explain those basics to them. Um, and sometimes it's just a motivation of like, you got to get out there. You got to walk around after your meal. You have to use up what's coming in. Um, and then we also talk about the importance of muscle, which I touched on earlier, uh, in the sense that obviously it's one of the first uh, places, you know, it goes to the liver, your body will store glucose in your liver, it'll store it in your muscle. And if those are all filled up, it'll probably store it as fat. So, um, we really want to make sure that they are building muscle. This is pretty key for women. Men are like, oh, sure, sure, no problem. Women are a little bit more uh, tentative to start a strength training program, although that's starting to change. Um, but it's really just a matter of encouraging someone to get some dumbbells or you know, it doesn't have to be a whole rigorous progress, a process of, of starting a you know, massive deadlifting um, 
uh, uh, practice. So we really, again, we meet people where they are, but for exercise, that's really it. When it comes to stress, it is incredible when people see it in their data. I have a lawyer who goes to court, I think like two or three times a week. Every time he goes to court, it's like, it's up and it stays high and it stays high. And then when he leaves court in the early afternoon, it drops right back down, right? The guy's eating a great breakfast. You know, clearly it, it, it's a clear stress indicator. I've seen it, um, you know, someone has a stressful phone call. Someone has an argument with their partner. Their, their, their glucose goes up purely in response to the cortisol spike. So um, it's really interesting. I think people are fascinated by the fact that their body is physically adapting to these higher stress situations and it's happening on a constant basis. So we can work on some of those in the moment stress techniques breathing exercises, encouraging someone to think about starting a meditation practice or just being in nature, you know, whatever kind of works for them uh, to, to lower that um, parasympathetic uh, nervous system reaction. So another really interesting, one of the, the fourth pillar, if you will, uh, that besides the nutrition and the stress and the exercise is sleep. And it's fascinating to see in someone's data after a poor night's sleep, not only is their baseline generally a little bit higher, um, but generally their ability to process carbs and their um, their reaction to certain carbohydrates can be different. So we think it's super interesting to, to look at that. You can do some comparisons. And a lot of times someone will say, what, you know, I'm eating the same lunch I had the past three days. Why does it look so different today? And, you know, you can kind of go through a couple different things, but then we always say, you know, how did you sleep last night? And people are like, oh, actually it was terrible. I was up a bunch or whatever. And, and it's, it's really fascinating how the body compensates for that kind of uh, poor sleep stress state that it's in the next day um, and how it processes the, the incoming energy. You know, you mentioned exercise and how it's not insulin dependent. I think that it's worth highlighting because when I think about all those four pillars, of course, individually, it's going to matter. Every single person is going to be different in terms of how much it's going to move the needle. But if I had to make a general statement, I would say activity by far exceeds every single one of them in terms of how it affects your glucose response. And for those who don't know, right, insulin is the key that's going to open the lock. So the glucose is going to go into a certain organ, whether it's the liver, whether it's going to be, you know, um, in the muscle, whatever it is. But exercise is unique in the sense that it opens the key without the need for insulin. And everybody's heard probably of insulin at this time. And you know, hyperinsulinemia, some people will say is the canary in the coal mine, right? That's what's leading to metabolic ill health down the road, which leads me to my next question uh, and getting your thoughts about OGTTs. And maybe I'll just briefly explain it for those who don't know, an oral glucose tolerance test, right? And so if you've ever been pregnant and you've had good care throughout, you've certainly familiar with this, but basically what it is, is that you take about 75 grams of this uh, drink. A lot of people say that they hate glucola, but when I did it, I actually liked it. That was pretty good. Uh, some lime flavor that I had. And then within 30 minute intervals, you're going to get your glucose checked. And what you're looking for is an appropriate spike. And then over time it comes down. And then I think within two hours, it should be back to baseline. Is that, did I explain it correctly? Yep. What some who are proponents of the carbohydrate insulin model or just really insulin as uh, a significant contributor to obesity epidemic will say, well, we should also be checking your insulin response because again, that and hyperinsulinemia over time is what's causing, causing metabolic Ill, Ill health. I don't remember those numbers off the top of my head, but again, similarly, insulin should spike. And then with an appropriate time in about 60 to 90 minutes, you should be coming, you know, somewhat close to baseline. And if that stays elevated for prolonged periods of time, that suggests that you are in this hyper, you know, insulin resistant stage, as the name suggests. My question for you is, what are your thoughts about that test and periodically doing that? Because, you know, the insulin response is almost more meaningful to me than the glucose spikes up and down. What do you think? I totally, I love it when we have members that are like, let's do it. Let's experiment. Cause I'm like, let's do the at home OGTT. Cause those are, you're right. It's so fascinating, right? You maybe, maybe many men have probably never even done this, but you can do it at home with honey. You can do it with white rice. You can do it with any type of, you know, 
popsicles and whatever it is, 75 grams of a simple carbohydrate. And you just kind of sit there for two hours. You kind of have to block it out of your day. Um, but cause we, you know, we don't want the confounding factors of, Oh, well then I got up and I went running or something. Um, you know, or I was at work or moving around a ton or something like that. So it does take a little bit of forward planning, but it's absolutely fascinating. That is exactly what we're trying to see. You take in this glucose. How does your body respond to it? That's 100% the name of the game um, when we're when we're really trying to test out and see what your body can do. And we do use, we have a metric called glycemic variability, the standard deviation um, of your data. And we do use that as a proxy a little bit for, you know, for how, how your body is responding to insulin. So a lot of people say, well, you know, how can I, how can I use this? Or what if my baseline is off? How can you tell me, is this really, am I really a fasting glucose of 92? And we say, you know, regardless of calibration, regardless of that, let's just look at what your response is to your carbohydrates. And we see that in your standard deviation metrics, right? We can see how you do when you go out for sushi. We can see how you do after you have four beers. You know, we can see how you do when you have these higher carbohydrate meals, how well does your body respond to that carbohydrate? And therefore, how, how well is your body responding to the insulin that it's producing? So absolutely, we have to use the CGM as a proxy, but that's exactly what we're getting at. Awesome. So Catherine, as we come to a close here, I want to ask you about, we started off at the outset talking about how wearable, you mentioned how one of the reasons you got into it was because you believe wearable is kind of the future. I think we probably agree. Again, we're all wearing one, which actually I meant to ask you, were you wearing a CGM prior to coming on board for NutriSense or did you have any experience with that? Or were you wearing any other wearables technology? Um, I had only ever worn uh, like an Apple watch. Um, and, but I'm wearing a CGM right now. I love it. It's like my favorite thing. <laughs> um, and I was super jazzed, uh, to work for NutriSense. Yeah. Because of that. Um, you know, I have friends that wear the aura ring, uh, friends that wear a whoop band, but for me, I've gotten way more out of the CGM because it shows me that bigger picture, right? The whoop band might tell me, yeah, I need to get up and move more. Like, sure, fine. You know, the aura ring might tell me that I'm not sleeping that great. Fine, fine. But I can see all of that in my CGM data. <laughs> Get more bang for your buck. <laughs> but what, what, what do you mean? How do you see the sleep stuff and activity stuff and strain scores? But you, how do you see that in the... Well, sorry, I, sh I shouldn't say it. it's not the exact metrics, but I can be told that I'm not moving enough through my CGM data. I can right. see that I'm not sleeping well enough through my CGM data. Um, so in my, in my opinion, I get the fuller picture with my glucose levels than just getting the one reading sort of the siloed readings from the other things. Interesting. Yeah, no, you know, I mean, cause it's, it's all, those are secondary signs, right? But I think it would be really hard to disentangle if you were having a lot of life stressors, i.e. newborn, and then you're also not sleeping well, which again, you can extrapolate, but then if you're also stressed at job, but then identifying which stressors are the ones that spike that cortisol response, like the lawyer you told us, because, um, you know, diverting your energy to to certain places in times of maybe when people feel time poor, I can say this because, you know, my kid is a lot younger than, than yours and, and I feel that, although you have three, so I don't know who gets to win that one, but um. <laughs> I let's talk a little bit about the, the futures of CGM. There are more and more companies popping up that are offering these services. I think once you go on to, I did take that, that, um, the quiz, the, you know, about what type of learn or, um, is it learner? What type of, uh, support do you want? And all that kind of stuff. I, I fill that out. Uh, but once I think it did that, then of course, every part of my Instagram feed, Twitter, everywhere, I'm getting bombarded with different companies who I never even heard of. And so more and more are popping up, suffice it to say, what do you think? that CGMs are going to be a couple of years from now. Like, is it, what are you most excited about in terms of the technology evolving in terms of the data? Like, what do you think? I think it's fascinating. I'm hoping that it becomes more mainstream. I'm hoping that it becomes more acceptable in terms of medical practices, that this is just a part of your routine, uh, annual physical. This is just a routine part of taking care of yourself and you know, life, you know, just longevity and, and just making sure that, that you are a healthy individual. I'm hoping that it becomes routine mm -hmm. in the workplace to offer this, you know, through like a health and wellness program. Um, you know, that's that's my hope. Um, I also think, though, you know, there's a lot of talk about the AI and the chat GPT. And is that going to take the place of doctors? Is that going to take the place of medical professionals, you know, of all 
stripes. Um, and I'd, I'd like to say absolutely not, right? We offer the human perspective. There's nothing wrong with a little AI saying, hey, that banana spiked you. Fine. I'll give it to the computer, right? But it's the nuance of the coach. It's the nuance of the dietitian. It's the experience. It's the knowledge. It's using different decision trees that AI can't do, right? And that doctors can't do. You have to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with your patient, with your, with your person. And that's where the technology can't stand alone, right? You can't just have a robot doctor. You can't just have a robot dietitian. You have to have someone, you know, with some empathy and some real thought behind it, creative thought. And I, I definitely agree with that. I'll, I'll take the other side of this. So me and Altmash talk about this all the time. I'm very, I guess I'm pro AI, but I do think there is going to be a time where it's going to weed out a lot of the health professionals, especially from the empathy standpoint, right? And I know a lot of the medical schools now are requiring a test that <clears throat> will allow them to see how, I guess, flexible a student can be in terms of their social intelligence, emotional intelligence, looking at ethical kind of things. So it's definitely going to be um, an interesting next couple of years. I was actually just listening to Lex Friedman as well, um, interview Sam Altman about the future of ChatGPT and kind of where he thinks it's going to go. So definitely a lot to talk about, follow up on um, in that regard. McCathin, overall, I just really want to say thank you. Um, CGMs to me have always kind of been this gray area where, you know, I knew what they looked like. I knew what they did, but I never truly understood its true potential. And obviously we have a lot of patients coming in now wearing them. And I think, you know, this last hour or so has really helped me to understand how to better support my, my patients that come in with it, but also those who may not be wearing one and who, who are looking for that potential solution to understand, as Altamar said, which life stressor is it that's really, you know, bugging me out and causing me this quote unquote headache uh, throughout the day. Um, so thank you for that. Um, on that note, where can our listeners find you and where can they find NutriSense on socials? Absolutely. We are... Yes, on uh, we're, I think we're we're all over the socials, even if I'm not. Um, but our website is www.nutrisense.io, and I need to give a plug for our blog. We call it the journal. And even if you're not sure that a uh, CGM is right for you right now, it is an incredible resource with great evidence-based articles, bite size. You can really get a sense for how this technology can help you, and maybe if. You have a, 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 an issue. How does that relate to your to your glucose and to your blood sugar? So I definitely recommend everyone go at least to our website to check out um, our articles. They are fantastic. But you can also find us on Instagram. If you just say our name enough times, your phone will pick it up. <laughs> but it's um, we're at NutriSenseIO <laughs> and I'm at C Staffieri underscore RDN. So um, you will find us. I'm sure. I'm sure your your listeners will will find us. And um, I hope you guys take the plunge and and put one on. For sure, absolutely. And I will say, I think it's not only just for patients, but also providers to learn from wearables, as we just talked about these last 10 minutes, are definitely the future. I think they're even coming out with now blood pressure monitoring um, for 24 hours. So definitely a lot to look forward to. Um, Catherine, our last question here that we ask all our guests is how do we add the health back to healthcare? Oh, the health back to healthcare. That's a tough one. I mean, I think it's, I think it's really right now in this day and age and people are so, um, I think really stressed about themselves and there's a lot of sort of inward thinking. I think taking care of who you are, making sure you have a supportive community. It could be your doctor, it could be your family, it could be friends, but that really helps promote a better lifestyle overall. Finding those people that care about you, that care about your health, that want you to be the best person that you are is a motivating factor uh, for your own self-improvement. So I say, look around you, make sure you have a supportive community and people that are rooting for you. Love that. Thanks so much, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, guys. This is great. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to that episode. If you are interested in tracking your own glucose and seeing what type of lifestyle factors are affecting it, make sure to check out the NutriSense website. Make sure to reach out to Catherine and even check out their social medias. Also, be sure to check out the Medicine Redefined Instagram, TikTok, as well as Twitter. We are posting tips, tricks from all of our episodes right there so that you'll never miss a beat. 
As always, our medical disclaimer, everything in this podcast is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, and we are not providing medical advice. No physician-patient relationship is formed, and anything discussed in this podcast does not represent the views of our employers. We recommend that you seek the guidance of your personal physician regarding any specific health-related issues. And thank you to our team, Ethan Ju and Harita Yepuri, for the production of this podcast. See you next week. Thank you.